Well, our recent video on the 22 Creedmoor has brought to my attention the reality that we may have too many 22 centerfire cartridges, <laughs> and these aren't all of them. But why don't we take some time to sort out the 22 centerfires and figure out just why they've come into being and what they're good for on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors. <laughs> Well, 22 fans, I'm sure some of you are wondering what the heck is a 22 centerfire even good for? It's not legal for deer hunting in several states, but it is in some others. And even though many of us think it's too small to be used on big game, by golly, many of them are used and used quite successfully. They have been around since, gosh, at least the 1930s. And they don't seem to be going away. In fact, the development on them has been proceeding by leaps and bounds here in the 21st century. And that's why we had one just uh, recently on a video called the 22 Creedmoor, the most recent development in a 22. Uh, several of us think it's probably the optimum right now, but it's not the fastest it's ever been created. So I thought we would go through some of the current ones and not covering a Wildcats, just the ones that you can actually buy from uh, major manufacturers and uh, just see what they're all about. And as you can see here, we've got a fair representative line of them, not all. And I've made up a chart and I've put some useful information on there, like they're roughly their top velocities, but also when they were built. And from which parent case, because I don't know about you, but it's always fun for me to find out exactly where these things came from. So the one that started it all was the 22 Hornet, and that's that little guy on the end. You can see it's kind of old-fashioned looking. Got a fairly blunt bullet on it. It is a rimmed case, which was kind of all the style back in the day, before the rimless really started to take over. But it's not as old as I thought it would be. It uh, came out in 1932. Um, but it was really popular because, as you can see, it's just not very big, doesn't burn very much powder. Generally came with a 40-grain bullet, maybe a 45-grain bullet. But uh, I decided what I would do with all of these to sort of put them into perspective as far as their performance and how fast they could drive a bullet. I would figure their velocities out for a 55-grain bullet. Rarely do you see 55s loaded on a 22 Hornet. Might have to hand load to actually get it, but it gives us an idea of how it ranks with these others. So with a 55 grain bullet, this 22 Hornet could drive that 2,652 feet per second. I got most of my data from the Hodgden website where they give loading data for just about every cartridge you could imagine. And of course, they're using test barrels. And I don't always know if they're using a 22, 24 or 26 inch barrel. Usually they're in that range, but that's going to affect all of the velocities here from each of these cartridges. So of course, we always say your mileage varies. And that's true. Not only is it a, a difference in the length of your barrel, but the tightness of your barrel and the tightness of your chamber, a lot of things can contribute to uh, velocity, increase and decrease both. But so these are just sort of general numbers to put us in the ballpark. And the way I've lined all these up on the chart here is from the oldest to the newest. Um, no, I didn't do that. I decided to go with the slowest to the fastest. So say the weakest to the most powerful. All right, so there was your 22 Hornet, and we've got a surprise coming up here that popped up just a couple of years after the Hornet came out. I think it was only three years later that one came out that set a speed record that's lasted a long, long time, and it was really kind of shocking. Usually you have a slow evolution up the speed uh, chart with these things, but boy, not in this case, and we'll get to that one in a bit. But first, there's the 218B, which is one of the cooler names for a 22. Got the sting like a B is, I think, the whole idea. That came out in 1938 from Winchester, and it was based on the 2520 Winchester cartridge, a small little small game cartridge in the late 1800s. Um, that was kind of the go-to for what we now would consider a good uh, category for a 22 win mag. Uh, Rimfire or the 22 Hornet, but um, this one I don't have a ballistic uh, speed number on it because I couldn't find anything with 55 grain bullet because this thing is built for a lever action rifle. So the 218B is always loaded with flat nosed or round nosed bullets because of the tubular magazine thing. It's uh, faster than the 22 Hornet, had a lot of potential, but because Winchester brought it out in a lever action, 
it really is not all that viable and it's pretty much gone by the wayside. And a lot of the hand loading manuals, you can't even find data for loading it anymore. But for anyone who has that, I think it was a Model 64 Winchester lever action. It was really fun, uh, fun little plinking gun. But I think Winchester was thinking it would be a kind of a farm varmint plinking rifle, good to maybe 150 yards at most, um, because it was open sided lever action. They weren't thinking of scopes and all the rest of it. But the 218B would be, oh, probably one to 200 feet per second faster than the 22 Hornet. But downrange, I'm guessing with a little more efficient bullets, the Hornet would probably surpass it. Then we come to the 221 Fireball. The Remington Fireball came out in 1963 in a handgun. And it was based off of the 222 Remington, which came out in 1950. So here's the 221. You can see it's just a shortened 222. Uh, sidewall looks to be straightened out a little bit more. Um, and that was real popular in a little Remington bolt action handgun. Um, and only in recent years did it really become popular in uh, rifles. If I remember right, about 15 years ago or so, Remington came out with it chambered in, I think, the Model 7. Uh, but you can always chamber it in any short little light rifle. I would guess the Howa Mini action would fit pretty well with that 221 Fireball. That thing will drive that 55 grain bullet 2,944 feet per second. Then we have the 222 Remington itself. That was a really famous 222 or 22 caliber cartridge. Came out in 1950, designed by Remington from whole cloth, no parent case. And it set the world on fire and all sorts of bench rest records because it was so consistent and mild recoil and they could just really sit down and concentrate on dropping them in there. And it's often been said that 222 Remington is just so agreeable to just about any load that you could take. Ball BLC 2 powder was the hot one back in the day. And you could just scoop that case, empty case in that powder, brush it off, or shake a little bit out, and they'd all shoot to the same hole anyway. I don't know if I'd recommend that for precision shooting, but that's kind of how famous that was as a little fox and coyote and target cartridge. But a lot of guys were using it back when I was a kid in the late 1960s to hunt deer. It can do the job, but obviously it's quite small. It's not what you would consider the optimum. But you place your shots carefully, and that little bullet can explode in the heart-lung cavity and do a remarkable job. Uh, typically, you'd shoot a 50-grain bullet in it rather than the 55, but it has been loaded with 55s, and it's capable of pushing those 3,070 feet per second. All right, well, that thing then gave rise to the 223 Remington and at the same time, the 5.56 NATO. It's just a variation of the 223 Remington, and that is a, a little bit elongated uh, version of the 222, but it's not as long as another one on our list here real quick, which is the 222 Remington Magnum. That came out in 1958, and it was a result of the research project the military was doing to get this 222 shooting fast enough to work in the new military rifles, which became, well, the uh, M16. And of course, there's your AR-15 platform. That's all based on the 223. So the 222 was first, and then they just lengthened it out and made the 222 Rem Mag, of which I don't have an example here. That's another one that's pretty much obsolete. And then they just changed the uh, twist rate in the barrels and put longer bullets on it for the military in that NATO version called the 5.56 NATO. But there's your 223. Um, that one was 1964. Both of them, although the, the official NATO cartridge, I don't think was adopted until like 68, or at least that's when our military finally grabbed it. And that's going around two, two, or 3,240 feet per second with a 55 grain bullet, obviously for both the, the 223 and the 556. Then we jump to a, a fairly modern one, this Valkyrie. The 22 Valkyrie from Federal Cartridge Company. And that one has quite a bit in common with the next one up, which is a 22 Nosler. And a, later on, we're going to have a 22 ARC cartridge in here. But those were designed for optimum performance in the AR 15 platform rifles. So you're not going to exceed the length of the 223, 2.26 inches overall length fits into the magazines get a little more horsepower out of them because both of them as you can see are a little bit fatter but they're also following that new trend to the uh, pushed back shoulder a little bit shorter case that way um, and then a longer bullet and the Valkyrie was designed to spin stabilize 70 to 90 grain bullets they got 
I think they're a little bit less than the twist rate you need for optimum stability with a 90 grain. That seems to be what most people are finding. But boy, with the 75 and 80 grain bullets is working really well. When that came out in um, 2017, the same time the competition did, the Nosler, uh, and that was uh, pushing things a little bit faster according to the charts here. But the Valkyrie, uh, based on the 6.8 SPC cartridge, that little um, Remington 270, and that one goes 3,374 feet per second, according to the Hodgson manual. The Nosler will be coming up in a bit here, that further down the list, because it's a little bit faster. As you can see, there's quite a bit more capacity in there for powder. Before we get to that, though, back to that 222 Remington. I wish I had it standing in here, but it's not. We should have put a gap for it. <laughs> the gap would be right there. And that 222 Rem Mag, even though it came out in 1958, as I said, and was based off the 222 Remington, it's driving bullets at 3,451 feet per second. I would have thought, and I did back in the 60s and early 70s, that that would have been the more popular cartridge. Uh, but the 223, of course, took over be because the military was making so much of it. Brass was available, um, military surplus ammo and that sort of thing. So that just took over and buried the uh, 222 Magnum. Then there's the, the newest one, the 22 ARC, and I don't have one of those yet either. Just came out like December of last year, or maybe it was officially announced at the SHOT Show this year. And that is the 6mm ARC cartridge, advanced uh, rifle cartridge, I think they call it. That's what it stands for. And that is another one competing with the Valkyrie and the Nosler for the short fat in higher performance out of your AR platform rifles. And of course, you can chamber that in anything else if you want to. But that's uh, supposed to be able to throw a bullet 3,450 feet per second, hanging right there with that Remington Magnum, and coming pretty close to the 22 Nosler. And here's our 22 Nosler. I don't know if you can see it, but it has a rebated rim. So the 22 Nosler doesn't have a parent cartridge. The uh, Nosler boys just decided you know, let's find ourselves a bolt face that's common to the AR-15 platform and then make the, the body a little bit bigger to get more powder in it, push things forward a bit. So they don't have the long neck the way the Valkyrie does, but they're getting a little more velocity. And I think they're twisted up one in eight, maybe one in seven uh, recommended twist rates on those. And they're driving 3,563 feet per second with a 55 grain bullet. And I think the idea with it, like the others, is to shoot the more uh, longer bullets for higher BCs, a little bit lower velocity. But that seems to be the trend these days. So you're going to be able to load those up to, gosh, I would imagine 80 grain bullets would stabilize in that. Now we get uh, back to an oldie. We're going to go back to the 60s here. And there's quite a bit of development in 222 type cartridges in the 60s. And one of them was the 224 Weatherby Magnum in 1963. Roy Weatherby thought, got a hole in the program here. You know, he had just about every cartridge and caliber you could imagine. Didn't have a 22, although one of his first cartridges, I think actually was his first, was the 220 Swift Improved. He called it a rocket, the 220 Weatherby Rocket. But it went away fairly quickly. I don't really know why. So he didn't have anything in the 22 line until 1963. He thought he'd better jump out there. And he came up with this little belted Magnum. And that also has no parent case, made it out of whole cloth. But sticking with what he was famous for, belted Magnums, he had to put a belt on that thing. <laughs> and it worked. You know, folks who loved the, the whole idea of the belted Magnum, thinking they had more power and they were faster, uh, they jumped on it. And oh, it was fast. It was pretty close to the... Uh, what would come later, the 22250 Remington, but um, it's not taken off the way it, the Remington has, and that's primarily because it was always a proprietary cartridge. You uh, went to Weatherby and you bought a Weatherby rifle chamber for it. It's about the only place you could find it. And uh, I think the only folks who ever made ammunition for it probably was Weatherby. But its biggest problem, with, in addition to that, I guess, a big problem was uh, the competition, which popped up really quickly. Starting with the 225 Winchester, should have another hole in the line here because I don't have that one. And that was surprisingly good ballistically, but it didn't go anywhere because it was competing against the 22250 Remington within a year. So Winchester came out in 1964 with it. 
And they based it on the 219 Zipper, which is a pretty obscure cartridge. It was a 22. And that one itself was based off of the 3030. Winchester had a lot of brass there, famous cartridge for them. So they just necked things down. And then when the one they went with is 225, knowing that they would have to compete with the 224, I suppose, and the upcoming 22250. I imagine they had spies and they all figured out who was developing what, because that seemed to be what happened back in those days. <laughs> if, one, if, if Big Green came out with a certain cartridge caliber Winchester would be right there with them something really similar think of the 243 Winchester and the six millimeter Remington which was first released as the 244 Remington both of those in 1955 and they almost identical performance uh, don't tell me that was an accident <laughs> they kind of know what they're doing there at any rate, the 225 Winchester, even though it could throw that 55 grain bullet 3,643 feet per second, which is running right with the 22250 of that day, boy, it just didn't take off because it had a rimmed case. A rimmed case in 64. What are they thinking? I have never understood some of the moves these companies made, especially Winchester and Remington. They came up with some great ideas and they flopped because they didn't put them in the right rifles or they came out with the right rifle, but they flopped because they built the cartridge with some something strange that just didn't work well in that rifle. And I think that's the problem with this one. It had, it had all the hallmarks of a classic bolt action rifle precision shooting cartridge, but they put a rim on it like the old Hornet and those don't work very well in vertical stack magazines for bold action rifles. So the next year, out comes the 22250 Remington. That's based off the 250 Savage. And that was running right on the heels of the 220 Swift, which is one we're going to be get to here in just a second. Um, so uh, you, the 22250 Remington was going 3,600, 650 or so. I think they actually pushed it to 3,700 feet per second when it first came out. And that was pretty high pressure. They were kind of pushing the envelope. And that's another thing they seemed to do in the mid-20th century. They were one of the fastest cartridges out there, so they really cranked them up. And you got it. But it was always a little bit risky. Some rifles you just never knew when something might just break loose. So they gradually reduced the pressures over time. And that's why hand loaders do so well these days. They can kind of run things safely back up to the original pressures and get a little bit more performance. And we're going to see it out of this 22250 here when we look at the numbers. But before we get there, I want to look at this 220 or this 22 Creedmoor that kind of started me on this whole project. This was the six millimeter Creedmoor neck down to 22. Just came out. And it's, I think, going to be kind of the new standard for the fastest shooting 22s. Uh, center fire. It's uh, going to be a little bit faster than the 220 Swift. And again, it's handling those long high BC bullets. And that's kind of all the rage. So I expect it to sort of take over. But right now they're uh, rating that thing at around 3,750 feet per second with a 55 grain bullet. And the reason I say around that is because we really don't know because they don't sell them currently with 55 grain bullets. They're set up for those fast twists, long, heavy bullets. I think they start with the 70 or 75 grain. They run all the way up to 80 grains. And who knows, you might see 90 grain bullets on top of that before it's all over. So uh, just keep your eyes open on that one. Now, the 220 Swift was, I don't know if everybody knows it, but Boy, it seems like most people understand this to be the fastest commercial cartridge ever. Well, it was in its day. And again, they throttled it back after a while. It also became known as a barrel burner, burning the throats out. If you shoot it fast, and a lot of them, you're going to burn out that throat because there's so much powder getting crammed down that little bore. But as you can see by its shape, it's just, gosh, it got that old fashioned look and shape to it. Not the sharper shoulders and the longer necks and things as the newer cartridges. And got quite a bit of taper in it, too. This thing came out of the 6 millimeter Lee Navy, a pretty obscure cartridge. It was an official military cartridge for the Marines and the Navy back in the late 1890s. Didn't last real long, but Winchester was loading it as a commercial round and even chambering some rifles for it. And when it sort of went away, I think they had extra brass lying around because that's what they made the 220 Swift out of. And it's an unusual semi-rimmed case. It's the rim sticks out just a little bit, just enough for the extractors to catch it, but not as much as most of the rimmed cases would. 
So it works pretty darn well in vertical stack magazines. I haven't heard too many people complaining that it's hard to feed or anything. So that was a screamer. It will still push a 55 grain bullet. Oh, around 3,840 feet per second or so. This is hand load information again from the Hodgson manual. I don't know if you're getting that anymore out of your factory loads. And there aren't all that many factory loads available into 20 Swift anymore. It's kind of an old fashioned cartridge. It still has its uh, fans who really love it, but I think these newer cartridges are taking over. And especially the 22250, because it had a little bit of a sharper shoulder, a little bit more modern look, still has a fair amount of taper in it compared to the newish ones like the Creedmoor, but it sort of took over from the, the Swift because it didn't have quite the same reputation for burning out throats. I don't know that there's a heck of a lot of difference between the two, um, if you load them both to max, you're probably looking at 100 feet per second different maximum velocity. So you're shooting quite similar powders, similar burning temperatures. I don't know that you're going to get a lot more barrel life out of the uh, 22250 as you do the 220 Swift. But those are the reputations, and a lot of these cartridges live and die by their reputations. And another one we don't have on the table is the European cartridge. It's the 5.56 by 57 millimeter RWS. And over in Europe, it's quite popular uh, for chamois hunting and roe deer. And it was put out in 1964 based off of, you guessed it, the 757 Mauser. That's the same one that was used to make our uh, 257 Roberts and our six millimeter Remington. So over here, if you'd have necked it down from a six millimeter Remington to a 22, you would have had, well, what is a Wildcat these days? The Texas Trophy Hunter, the 22 six millimeter Wildcat or 22 Texas Trophy Hunter, be pretty much the same thing as this 5.56 by 57 millimeter RWS. And then there's this short, <laughs> what do you call that guy? That's the WSSM that went poof and gone. Just it was a flash in the pan. Uh, Winchester came out with a whole series of those. This was the uh, narrowest caliber, 22. The 20, uh, 223, they called it, to uh, sort it out from all the rest of the 224s, but it shoots a 0.224 inch diameter bullet like the rest of them. The Super Short Magnum, 2002, it came out. The parent cartridge was, believe it or not, the 300 WSM. <laughs> so it's, it's wide and it's short and stumpy looking and just didn't do all that well. Sure was fast, though. 3,938 feet per second is what hand loaders are getting out of it these days. But I don't know that you can find rifles chambered for it anymore. And ammunition, still made by Winchester. Um, Browning might still have some WSM cartridges, but it's uh, not real popular. I don't think it's going to hang around for the long term. And that's kind of the list of them. Now, I think before we wrap this thing up, we really should look at some more numbers on these things. Um, and I think I want to go to the computer and we'll pull these things up and I can draw your attention to them a little more clearly. So let's go to the computer and compare some of the ballistic performance using not just 55 grain bullets, but the lightest ones, the fastest and the heaviest ones and see what our drops and drifts and deflections and things are. I think it'll be an eye opener. 22 center fires. Let's go. Hunting knives. And we all, if we're hunters, use knives. And I have obviously been using them for many, many years. And I have butchered a lot of animals. We cut up all of our own meat around here. I skin and cape out all my deer and elk and everything else. I've had my, my knives working on game up to the size of elephants and down to the size of frogs, believe it or not. So knives and I go way back. Our sponsor is Diamond Blade Knives. I met these folks up in Alaska on a guided hunt. The owner of the company happened to be a master guide, and I was fishing for salmon and uh, trying to hunt a moose up there. And this gentleman was my guide, and he had these beautiful knives sitting around in his lodge. And I started to get interested in them because they just looked so nice. And he started telling me about diamond blade knives. And what he had done was a bunch of research with a university in Utah to figure out how could you get the sharpest, hardest, edged knife that would keep its edge and not be brittle, not be breaking and be easy to sharpen. It seemed like an impossible task because over the years, we've all had knives that were wonderfully hard and sharp, but once they got dull, oh man, were they hard to get sharp again? Well, they came up with new technology that essentially takes the old art of hammer forging to a new level and they call it friction forging at the nano 
level. You have to have an electron microscope to see the differences in the crystalline structures of the steel. It's some really wild stuff, high tech. I don't know if you'd call it brain surgery or NASA scientist kind of stuff, but it's it's pretty impressive. And you can go to their website and look into it for yourselves. I don't know if you need a knife that stays as sharp as these things do. They tested the diamond blade steel against every other top quality steel out there used for knives and found out that it kept its sharp edge so much longer than the next best one. It was two times longer or four times longer. I would have to look, but it's impressive stuff. What I have noticed in the field is that I can take this diamond blade knife and do several deer before I need to sharpen it. And it sharpens up as quickly as any other knife I have. So it's not a difficult knife to sharpen. And I have never chipped or broken the edge on it. Despite it being that sharp and keeping that sharp, it doesn't chip or fray the edges of any kind. I just think it's an impressive knife. If you want to check it out, I'm tickled to have Diamond Blade Knives as my sponsors. I can certainly stand behind that product. All right, guys. Here, I'd like to show you some comparisons on twist rates and bullet weights. We've got muzzle velocities up here. The BC of the bullet, the maximum point blank range for a four inch diameter target. I think that's appropriate for 22 calibers, mostly used on uh, varmints, rodents, and coyotes and such. And then our deflections, drift, we're calling it, wind deflections at 300 yards and 500 yards. So the 22 Hornet usually has a one and 16 inch twist. And as I mentioned earlier, it's set up for 40 grain bullets, 35 grain bullets, but it'll go up to 50 with factory load sometimes. Here's your velocity, 3,155 feet per second with that light 35 grain bullet. Shoots pretty flat for that. Um, you've got a 0 0.201, pretty low BC on that bullet for maximum point blank range. Mm, 238 yards, not bad. Uh, you're going to have 15.2 inches of wind deflection and a 10 mile an hour right angle wind. And 500 yards is pretty hopeless with 51 inches. And stepping up to a 50 grain bullet slows your velocity to 2793. Get your BC up the bullet up a little bit. And you reduce your maximum point blank range down to 225. 300 yard drift, oh my gosh, you don't even save an inch. Hardly worth the effort. Go to the 221 Fireball, 1 in 12 twist. Now you're going to handle a little bit longer, sleeker bullets. Again, you can load that 35 if you want for maximum velocity, 3582. And 266 yards for maximum point blank range, 12.7 inches. That's a fair improvement over the uh, 22 Hornet. Still pretty hopeless at 500 yards, and you're not going to have much energy left out there anyway. I didn't put energy in, but you're talking varmint stuff out to 300 yards pretty much with this. Step up to that 55 grain bullet and 2,929. Pretty respectable for that little cartridge. Fairly uh, reasonable BC at 255. 232 yards for your maximum point blank range. Just about... Two and 12 and a half, about a foot and a half of a wind deflection at 300 yards. So, yeah, starting to get uh, pretty effective. 222 Remington. Usually a one in 14 twist. It'll handle up to about a 55 grain bullet. So you can see 3,821 is really smoking for that little thing. But, you know, that's a 35 grain bullet. And got you have same BC naturally, but look at this maximum point blank range is reaching clear out there to 281 yards. That's why it was such a popular fox and coyote load back in the day. 11.7 inches of wind deflection at 300 yards. Go to the heavier bullet, you knock that down to 11 inches. Again, not a huge deal. Three feet or so out at 500. I don't think anybody was going to be targeting things that, especially not deer, maybe a coyote at 500 yards, but you need a a little more velocity for that. So 223 Remington, 5.56 NATO. <clears throat> the only difference there really is a 1 in 14 twist is general on the 223, sometimes 1 in 12. So you're not going to stabilize much over about a 55 grain bullet. Whereas the NATOs are usually chambered 1 in 7. And the NATO cartridges, yeah, they might be given a little more pressure because the maximum average chamber pressure on there is about 2,000 feet per, uh, PSI more. Then a 223, but not a big deal. At any rate, if you shoot that light, light bullet, you're almost going 4,000 feet per second. And that gives you 11.3. But look, it's just not a heck of a lot better than the 222. Half inch difference in wind deflection. That's because we're using that same bullet, 
So you have the same BC of 201, 201. So there's not a huge improvement. Again, velocity helps a little bit, but most of that wind deflection business is because of the BC of the bullet. Um, but you step up to that 77 grain, now you got a much higher BC at 0.454. Yeah, you reduce your maximum point blank range, but look at the benefits you get in your wind deflection being knocked down to 7.3 inches. Huge improvement there. So step up to the Valkyrie, shoot it in the same AR-15 styles as you would your 5.56 NATO. Uh, one and seven, kicking to the twist there. They're thinking they know what that 5.56 NATO will do, so they want to do a little bit better. And uh, they're pushing... They're not quite reaching that same velocity. Now, this one is a 62 grain bullet because that's the lightest one that they're offering in factory loads that I've seen. Keeping your BC up at 395, maximum point blank range 272, six and a half inches of wind deflection. So not a heck of a lot bigger than that uh, NATO cartridge. And if you push the 90 grain bullet at only going 2676, so you're dropping a lot more. You've only got a maximum point blank range of 230 yards. But look at this, 6.2 inches of wind deflection. Again, not a big advantage over the 62. So I'm not sure I'd want to give up the uh, drop differences on that one. 22 Nosler, a little more powder in there, a little less twist rate, one and eight. So you're probably going to top out with an 85 grain high BC bullet in that one for stability. But look at this 40 grain bullet. You could load in it if you wanted. 4,027, that's about what the, the 220 Swift was famous for back in the day. Still, you have that poor BC bullet at 221. Got your maximum point blank range at 299 yards, 9.8 inches of wind deflection. But if you step up to that 85 grain bullet, 5.6 inches of wind deflection. You're starting to win that uh, wind deflection race right there with that high BC of 0.524. And again, 250 roughly on your maximum point blank range. Boy, that's not too shabby. Go to this new 22 ARC cartridge with the one and eight twist. And you see here, you get 2,850 feet per second versus 2,907. 85 grain versus, uh, bullet versus 88 grain. So those two, I think, if you use the same bullet, would be a wash. And you've got a little higher BC out of that 88 grain bullet. And that's the fastest one they're currently loading in the arc. So that gives you a 5.56 inch. These two are almost identical. You got a, a quite a bit better on this 6.5, but that's a 62 grain bullet versus a 40. So you're going to have a higher BC bullet there. But you're getting your 500 yard deflections down to something that's workable, I think. 20 inches down to 16 inches, you can work with that. 22, 250 Remington, 1 in 12 is your standard twist on that, unfortunately. 40 grain bullet. 4,336 feet per second. What a screamer. And again, you've got that low BC bullet at 0.221. But look at the maximum point blank range. You could hold dead on a coyote out to 317 yards. Dead center chest shot and get him. Nine inches of wind deflection. Um, 28. Yeah, pretty big out there again. That's the problem with the 22-250 and all the old uh, slower twist 22 center fires. They just weren't set up for the fast twist barrels and the high, C, high BC bullets. But if you go with a 60 grain bullet, that's about as what they'll stabilize. And that's not going to be a real long, sleek, high BC bullet. But better than nothing, 3,624 feet per second. Little higher BC there at 0.270 saves you a smidgen on your wind deflection. Not really worth the trouble in my book. I'd stick with I, my 22-250s, I stick with a 55 grain bullet. That's long been my favorite. I think it's the best compromise. And then the 220 Swift, pretty much the same thing, but they are generally twisted even slower than the 22-250. So, and again, they're driving it fast enough that you can probably get away with a 60 grain bullet. Go 3,712 feet per second. And pretty similar to the 22-250. I would really call these two twins. You really don't have much difference in them. Now we'll step up to the 22 Creedmoor, and I think we're going to see some improvements, mostly because of this. One and eight inch twist. You've got a little more powder capacity than your 22 250, about even with your 22 220 Swift. So they've been throttled back, as I've mentioned earlier. You can probably get them to go a little better than this, but not bad numbers anyway. And there's your best performance uh, for wind deflection. Uh, 5.2 inches using that 80 grain bullet 
out of a Creedmoor. 3,000, less than 3,300 feet per second, but you've got a 0.485 BC on that bullet, 276 yards point blank, and you're really saving your bacon on the wind deflection. For me, that is worth it because I can figure out my drops. They're constant. You're going to be fine using your turret dialing and or ballistic reticles, or even with five inches of drop, a little bit of holdover. I mean, just hold on the back line on a coyote and you're dropping it right in there. And on a deer, gosh, you're going to be right there. Now at 300 yards, you're still going to have plenty of energy in that big 80 grain bullet out of that 22 Creedmoor for deer. It holds on to 1,000 foot-pounds of energy at 450 yards. So that is a viable 300-yard whitetail load. Um, it's quite similar to a 243, shooting probably a high BC 80 grainish bullet. Uh, I think it might even have more energy on target with, uh, with the 80 grain. So nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. I think you might want to consider something like that. And, of course, you can try some of the 22 Wildcats to get up there with the fast twist barrel. I do that with a 22250 Ackley Improved, and it does almost exactly what the 22 Creedmoor does. The only trouble is I had to have it made in custom rifle, and I have to custom make my own ammunition. If you want to go factory, this is your baby. And if you want to have a, a lot of fun the old-fashioned way, go up to that 222 Remington if you can pick one up for a song. You've still got some pretty incredible performance out of that. And they made some beautiful accurate rifles back in the 60s and 70s. So there you go. Take your pick and enjoy, guys. And it's time again for tip of the week. Boy, those bells don't quit ringing, do they? <laughs> well, by the way, these are the bells we have for sale on Ron Spomer Outdoors.com website. Made by a local sculptor. <laughs> they think they're really pretty cool. If you're looking for something different, check out one of these freedom bells. The Second Amendment freedom bell. Um, from Doug Adams. He's quite the sculptor. And he shoots the base of these things. You can see some bullet holes in there. He hires me <laughs> to burn up my ammunition, putting holes in here. So he suggests that I sign these when someone purchases those. If you are interested, just go to our website and then uh, drop me in a comment or something. Say, hey, Ron, I'd like to buy that one and uh, sign it for me if you'd like. I'm happy to do that for you guys. And shipping is free, so don't worry about the weight because they are pretty heavy. <laughs> Now, the tip of the week is going to be the 22 center fires and what they're good for. If you have never used a 22 center fire and they are legal in your state for hunting pronghorn and smaller deer, and you have a recoil sensitive shooter, uh, or you have problems with your shoulders or your neck or something, and you just don't have a lot of recoil, don't be afraid to try a 22 center fire. With the right bullet, they have been proven remarkably effective on taking deer. Now, you want to stay within, gosh, I don't know that you'd want to go much farther than 250 yards. I know you can probably get the job done at three with some of the bigger 22s, especially with these new heavier bullets like in the new Creedmoor. But if you can stay closer, so much the better. And then go for that broadside shot behind his shoulders. I have done it several times with the 22250 class of cartridges, and it worked out beautifully. And man, there's just no recoil. And that means you're going to really concentrate and make those shots and be precise. It can work. Don't be afraid of the 22 center fires. <laughs>